the very beginning of religion. Its purpose was manifold. Man wanted to know where he had come from, where he was going, and how best to get there. There was also one other thing driving the human force. Men wanted to survive as long as possible. To do so, one needed to know how to get the upper hand on the environment and on events that were out of his control. When ancient men looked up to heaven, they were wondering how could they control weather, disease, procreation, the outcome of war and other forces, all of which were completely beyond human understanding. To do this, humans had to find a way to reach and influence the creator of these forces. The questions became, how does one appease, cajole, or manipulate God or the gods? How does one take a bribe to a god? The answer has always been sacrifice. From the time of caves and stone weapons to the Middle Ages, that belief has scarcely changed. Only the form of sacrifice has varied. Animals, the first and best fruits of crops, human children, virgin women, the blood, and, of course, the prayers of the believers. All have been deemed valuable and all have been used as sacrifice to various gods. And so it continued through the Middle Ages as the Black Plague tested the faith of men. The deadly plague would rear its monstrous head in Europe, coming in waves, the death between the 13th, 17th centuries were horrible. And the killings were estimated at 150 million people. The epidemics took one quarter of London's population. The disease was unrelenting, and people knew God could help. Yet most believe God himself had brought the plague upon them as a punishment for their lax and unholy ways. In the 1300s, the Black Plague had appeared in Europe and England. And at that time, in Europe, society was divided into three sections, the clergy, the soldier, and the workers. Above them all sat the king. And each section of society was tasked with supporting the other two sections. The clergy would pray for the society and see to the eternal souls of the people. The soldiers would protect and fight for the safety and preservation of the society, and the workers would feed and clothe the society. The plague was about to set all of that on its head. The plague had appeared, then briefly died out, and then surged again with no mercy. It was killing randomly and making all men equal in their mortality. Out of social pressure, a movement arose. It was a religious movement compelled by an extreme form of piety, bordering on zealous determination, that of a soldier during battle. It encompassed most lay people, and it elevated them to the status of clergy. These were men who were determined to take the punishment of God and to fight in their distinct way for the preservation of their society, and they were called the flagellant movement. The name was taken from the word flagellate, which means to whip or flog or beat. And these were people who believed that whipping themselves would bring them closer to Jesus through the mimicry of his suffering. And they believed that if they followed in the footsteps of Jesus as he was flogged by Pontius Pilate, it would mirror what Paul had written in Corinthians. Therefore, I run thus, not as uncertain I fight thus, not as beating the air, but I batter my body to bring it into serviceableness, of servitude, lest having preached to others, I might myself be disqualified. This is a Berean literal Bible translation. Punishing the flesh to bring one closer to spiritual awakening was no new idea. In the Catholic Church, people would wear hair shirts underneath their outer garments, the harsh material of the undergarment was itchy and stinging, the weave made of coarse hair it would cause whelps, uncomfortable suffering, and bringing them closer to Jesus. But the flagellant movement brought this to a totally new level. 
the entire movement may have started around the 1200s in Germany, where theologians such as Joachim of Flora predicted a second epic of mankind was coming to an end, and the third epic, after a mysterious event, would take place. It was destined to happen sometime in the late 1200s. The first epic was before the birth of Jesus, the second epic after his birth, and then the third epic would be the return of Jesus as we watch him come back as conqueror and king. The third epic was about to take place and would announce his return. Soon the movement had spread to Italy and beyond. And when the plague began, the followers believed that this was a predicted event, and that ignited the flagellant movement, and it exploded through Europe. According to a writer in 1348, a race or a movement without a head or a leader arose and caused surprise by its sudden appearance and its huge numbers. Although a large proportion of the flagellant movement seemed to have hailed from what is now today Germany and the Netherlands, they were also found in England and Italy and everywhere in between. They appeared in a sudden and seemingly spontaneous eruption of extreme faith, and these people called themselves the cross bearers because they followed a cross carried before them by one of their own comrades and from time to time would drop to the floor, the ground, and prostrate themselves in the shape of a cross on the ground now and then in their procession. And then they would arise and walk and whip themselves as they went. Each whip consisted of a stick with three knotted thongs hanging from the end with two pieces of needle-sharp metal run through the center left to right and up and down following the form of a cross. At the end of each strand, using the whip, they would beat their bare flesh until their bodies were swollen and whelped and bleeding. Blood would run down their bodies and splatter the walls and streets. They suffered not only for themselves, but they suffered for the people of their nation in the hope that God would see their suffering and their sacrifice and call off the plague. When they came into cities and towns, they formed themselves into a procession with hoods and hats pulled down over their foreheads, and with sad faces and downcast eyes, they would proceed through the town, singing sorrowful hymns until they had reached the church in the center of town, and there, like men confronting their own mortality, they would begin to whip themselves. It is reported that people of the town would gather around, and women would catch the drops of blood in bowls, thinking that it had some effect against sin and the plague. Members of the movement were treated like celebrities. The people would follow them from town to town. But it was noticed that from time to time, the plague would also follow the flagellants. Towns that were not touched with the plague would be overrun by the horror of it after the flagellant movement had left. They themselves were infecting the people they were trying to save. In 1349, over 600 men came to London from Flanders and Holland, and at St. Paul's Cathedral they would make two daily public appearances. They wore clothes from the thigh to the ankle, and they wore a cap marked with a red cross in front and back. Their backs were exposed, and they would beat themselves until they bled. Every night they would perform the same penance. Then they would retire to their lodgings in the towns, for the people had given them straw beds to sleep on, which were less than comfortable. But that was exactly the point, because they believed that the more they suffered, the more they would mitigate the evil of the world. Each procession would last three, uh, 33 and a half days to honor each year that Christ lived on earth. By the middle of the 1300s, the plague had begun to subside. Estimates of the death ranged at that time from 75 million to 200 million by the end of the plague. With the end of the Black Plague, the perceived need for the service of the practitioners of the flagellant movement had subsided. Flagellation was never church-sanctioned, and their actions were never endorsed by the Catholic Church. The Church tolerated them to begin with, but then, as they got more numerous and extreme in their behavior, 
they bordered on fanaticism. And when that movement took over, the church distanced itself from the practice and the movement. The church began to speak out against some of the practices and rituals and beliefs that they took hold during the flagellant movement. Some beliefs were deemed heretical. The work of sacrifice to purify one's soul brought to doubt regarding the need for the sacraments to remove sin. Baptism and the Eucharist were second to some because pain purified the soul. And since many flagellants were lay people, many began to deny the ecclesiastical jurisdiction and authority, believing that common folk could be as holy as the righteous priest. Some flagellants claimed to work miracles, which was the church's domain. And in short, the church needed to reassert its authority in the sacraments that it controlled and to say who and what constituted a miracle. To regain this status, the only portal to holiness, heaven, and the miracles were the church, and anything else was quenched with fervor that the church might restore itself to primacy.